Hackers are the outlaws of the computer age. Snooping, stealing, spreading viruses. No one has a good word for them today. But it wasn't always so. This hacker started a revolution in computers. And this is the hacker who inspired him. And this is the hacker who followed in their footsteps and paid the price. These three technological rebels are the pioneers of hacking. For Steve Wozniak, hacking is about invention. We were making a difference for humanity with these little small computers. For John Draper, experimentation. You know, take it apart and make it better, make it do different things, make it do cooler things. For Kevin Mitnick, hacking is about subversion. It's about the forbidden knowledge, it's about pranksterism, it's about trying to outsmart the other. It's about the knowledge, the intellectual challenge. The word hacker actually had two meanings. Before it meant something about breaking into computers or something, it meant guys who sit all night long on any piece of borrowed equipment they can, right. trying to get the program so ultimately perfect. Their stories reveal how hackers were the heroes of the computer revolution, but became outlaws in the world that they created. Hi. Hi. Where does this wire go? Well, you see, this is a telephone wire. And it's going to run from your house to the big table on top of that pole. We imagine hacking to be all about computers, but it wouldn't be possible without the telephone network. And that's where hacking began. In 1970, John Draper was fresh out of the military and was studying electronic engineering when he stumbled across a secret world. It all began with a call from a guy named Denny, who promised to reveal the secrets of a new craze, phone freaking. He started to explain to me about phone freaks. I said, what's a phone freak? <laughs> And he was explaining to me, well, we play with phones. I said, yeah, I can see that. I said, well, what do you do with phones? And he said, well, we, well, we understand the system. I said, can you make free calls? He said, well, why don't you come on over? I got a couple of friends over here that want to talk to you. I go to the door. His dad answers the door. I said, I'm here to see Denny. He said, Doc, come with me. He takes me in his room, open up his room, and it's like pitch dark in there. He said, you mind turning on the lights? They're all blind. They don't need lights. So we got to talking, and I said, show me one of these ways of making a free call. I'm really interested. We knew, of course, that it was illegal, and I, I guess you know, part of the thrill of it, and, and it, was, it, was, it wasn't really just to rip out the phone company. I mean, it, was the, it was the technical challenge to be able to do it. At a time when calling long distance was a luxury, phone freaks found a way of doing it for free. Telephone networks were controlled by tones, Getting in was easy, with the right equipment. It came in the shape of a free gift in a packet of breakfast cereal. This guy, right here, the Captain Crunch Whistle. And if you glue this hole right here, like this, that's 2600. When you blow the whistle into the phone, a little kerchink sound, that's the acknowledgement coming in from the other side saying, you're ready to process the call. Armed with a Captain Crunch whistle, phone freaks could seize control of telephone lines anytime, any place, anywhere. In fact, one of the things that we used to do is to go to the go to the airport, walk along blowing the whistle next to a bank of payphones, <laughs> and disconnect their calls. In the days when calls went through to operators, phone freaking wasn't possible. But as human switchboards were replaced by mechanical systems, different noises were used to trigger the switches. If you had perfect pitch like blind phone freak Joe and Grecia, you could whistle calls through the network. Let's see if I make it this time. This 
is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing about now. Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while. He even it. showed off his skills for the local media. Now, From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand-mile phone call by whistling. Joe Ingressia says he used to do these things because he is fascinated by the technology. Those are the precursors of the hackers. Those are the founding fathers. <laughs> For phone freaks like Captain Crunch and Denny, the telephone system was a huge technological playground full of sounds and switches to explore. Thirty years on, they're getting together to relive their exploits. Hi, Denny. Hey, buddy. How are you? Welcome to the sea. Yeah. Hey, there. Hey, there. Hey. Come on, buddy. Denny. Here. Let's go phone system. I got to spy out with this box. The golden rule was never freak from home. If you did, the phone company could trace you. During the time that I was with Denny, I would pile Denny up in the Volkswagen van. We'd go after the absolute smallest rural area we could find on a map. Go out there and just camp out at a payphone and start hacking. Once they knew the tones that controlled the switches, Phone freaks could travel down the lines from exchange to exchange and from city to city. But they needed better ways to make the tones. This was where John Draper's engineering expertise came in. Phone freaking was about to go high tech with the invention of a gadget called the Blue Box. First thing I did was build a Blue Box. The case you can get down at Radio Shack or anywhere else. It's just a standard old project case. The keyboard pad, I can think we got that from like a junkyard or something like that. The blue box is nothing more than a tone generating device that generates a certain set of tones. And the phone company thinks these tones are coming from their own switching equipment when indeed they're only coming from you, basically. It's the game of the kingdom. If I wanted an operator in New York, I do key pulse, one, two, one, start, and it can for me to the operator in New York. Your call cannot be completed. Equipped with a blue box, phone freaks make calls all over the world, often just for the fun of hearing a recorded message in a foreign language. <laughs> The fact that phone company allowed the system to be set up that way was really flabbergasting me. I couldn't believe it, and it was that easy to do. KP182, start. The patterns of the numbers really intrigued me. I was actually in, the, in an upper level uh, access of the phone company. I was, I was in, a, in a real raw level of access. Blue Box technology was Freaking's big bang. The illicit network expanded. And before long, phone freaks were holding secret meetings on conference lines deep inside the system. Most, most people would just talk about phones. Most people would talk about, you know, usual things kids talk about, their girlfriends and phones and things like that. We had a girl on here, you know, from California. She played operator. So she had a person-to-person -person call from Jerry Doyle in Miami. The conferences of those days were kind of like what the chat rooms are today. I'm in Florida, Derek. Hi. Uh, I never talked to you before. Are you in Australia? No, I'm in England. Oh, England. I can't tell the two accents apart, you see. It was a social place for me to meet my friends or friends that were in the same interest that I had. Gee, it's funny being on a conference without, without big mouth chess, man. <laughs> it was kind of like a secret society. This is the smallest, lightest, most easily concealed blue box now made by underground scientists. But the secret society was growing. When phone freaks have a convention, people don't give their right names. Masks are given out at the door. The only phone freaks, I think, had, uh, did their freaking with the hacker mentality. Uh, one of the most complex systems on earth at that time was the phone system. And to be able to know its ins and outs was you know, a very rich field of discovery. There was a guy that called himself around the world, from the one payphone, around the world with a payphone beside him. He's like, hello, and there's a lag, and hello, how are you, I'm fine, you know? It wasn't just mechanical switches that the phone freaks learned to manipulate. They also became skilled at manipulating phone company employees, an art they called social engineering. 
Social engineering, I'm freaking Denny was the expert on that. That's just, a, that's just the ability of going in and talking to people on the inside of the phone company, uh, making them believe that you're working for the phone company. Ron, how you doing? Good, buddy. This is uh, Bob from the uh, Alpine office in uh, Phoenix, Arizona. We had a test uh, that we needed to run, a transmission test, and you have the sleeve lane. Uh, broken off on the uh, intercepts travel and then put the strap back on. We can call the switch room, we can call the frame room, we can say, well, this is uh, Fresno here. we got translation error going into your trunk here. Could you pull up trunk number of this, that, and the other thing and, and give me the trunk ID code for this, that, and the other thing, you know? I mean, and the guy would do it. When the phone companies finally noticed the intrusion, they were less than happy. You know, a lot of us were certainly warned a number of times by, uh, you know, phone company uh, special agents and that kind of thing, phone company, uh, telephone company security people.